Welcome everyone to this EU Settlement Scheme training, which will provide an overview of complex cases. I'm Bella, Joint CEO of a charity called Here for Good, and I'm also an immigration lawyer. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Carla, I'm Here for Good's volunteer coordinator, and I'm also an immigration lawyer based at Bayman. So for those of you who don't know, I'm going to give you an introduction to Here for Good. So Here for Good is a legal charity which exists to provide free immigration advice to EU, EEA and Swiss citizens and their family members living in the UK. We primarily assist those with complex applications under the EU settlement scheme and our services include an email and telephone advice line, complex casework done by our members of staff and we also have a network of volunteer lawyers who are taking on complex cases across the UK. This training is commissioned by the Greater London Authority and delivered by us at Here for Good. We are conducting 16 EU settlement scheme training sessions between June and October 2020. These include this overview of complex cases training, as well as specific EU settlement scheme training on working with children, the elderly, the homeless and criminal records. The training is designed for OISC Level 1 EU SS advisors, OISC Level 2 or 3 advisors who do not regularly advise on EU SS cases, and individuals providing frontline support to vulnerable persons. It's worth noting that this training is not designed to replace official OIST training, and also that while Carla and I are experts in immigration law, we are not experts in immigration regulation. If you are therefore OIST accredited but unsure of what work you can do at your level, we would recommend contacting OIST directly. The contact details of OIST and other regulators are also provided in our training manual, which will be sent to you after this session. So before we go into the main section of this training, we're just going to give you a brief overview of the EU settlement scheme. We are aware that some of you may have already have a good understanding of the information covered in this section. However, as we have people of different levels of experience attending, we think it may be beneficial for some of you to have a refresher of the EU settlement scheme. This brief overview will cover the legal background and framework who needs to apply under the EU settlement scheme, the relevant deadlines, key requirements for settled status, and an overview of the application process. I should note that section one to two of the training manual, which will be provided after the session, give a much more detailed overview of the EU settlement scheme. They also provide a step-by-step -step guide to the application process. Please therefore refer to these sections of the manual after the session if you need to familiarize yourself further. So firstly, we're going to look at the legal background and framework behind the EU settlement scheme. So the legal background, as we all know, is essentially Brexit. On the 31st of January 2020, the UK officially left the EU and the withdrawal agreement between the UK and EU was implemented into UK law as the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act. As we all know, the UK is currently in a transition period, which is due to last until the end of this year, the 31st of December 2020. From the 1st of January 2021, as far as we understand, a new points-based immigration system will apply. To understand the EU settlement scheme, it is important to be aware of both EU law and domestic law. Under EU law, the rights of EU, EA and Swiss citizens and their family members come from something known as the Free Movement Directive. The Free Movement Directive was implemented into domestic law as the Immigration EEA Regulations 2016. As a result of the withdrawal agreement, Appendix EU was implemented under UK law. Appendix EU is the legal framework behind the EU settlement scheme. Currently, these legal frameworks coexist. However, the EEA regulations will be repealed, most likely at the end of this year. It is important to note that this will directly affect those applicants who cannot apply under the EU settlement scheme until they have been granted a document under the EEA regulations. We will discuss this more later on. So, in terms of the EEA regulations, it is good to have at least a basic understanding of these. As you may know, under the regulations, an EU, EA or Swiss citizen has an initial right to reside in the UK for three months. To continue to reside, they will then need to be considered a qualified person. To be a qualified person under EU law, you must be exercising treaty rights, which includes working, studying, being self-employed, 
being self-sufficient and looking for work. After five years of exercising treaty rights, a person will automatically acquire the right of permanent residence under EU law in the UK. Under the regulations, EU citizens can also have certain family members join them. There are various different documents which you can apply for to confirm your rights under EU law. These will be discussed later on. And as I just noted, due to Brexit, all of these documents will cease to be valid after the 31st December 2020. Those who hold them must therefore still apply under the EU settlement scheme. So now looking at Appendix EU, as noted, Appendix EU has been developed as part of the withdrawal agreement. Appendix EU is the legal framework for the EU settlement scheme. As we all know, the EU settlement scheme is a mechanism through which EU, EA and Swiss citizens and their family members can apply to secure their rights in the UK. At present, this run, runs parallel to those EEA regulations 2016. As I'm sure you're all aware, there are two types of status that can be granted under the scheme. These include indefinite leave to remain, also known as settled status, for those who have lived in the UK for five years or more and limited leave to remain, also known as pre-settled status, for those who have lived in the UK for less than five years. So what is the difference between the EEA regulations and Appendix EU? So the main difference between these is that under the EU settlement scheme, the main requirement is residence in the UK. There is no need to demonstrate that the applicant has been exercising treaty rights. The applicant just needs to have been resident in the UK. It is also worth noting that under the EEA regulations, the right to reside is acquired automatically, whereas you must apply for status under the EU settlement scheme in order to obtain residency rights. This next slide shows the different documents issued under the EEA regulations and the EU settlement scheme. It is important you're aware of the documents issued under the EEA regulations, as you may come across people with them in your work and as discussed later, they are required for some EU settlement scheme applications. Also, due to Brexit, as I've noted, these documents will cease to apply after the end of this year. Those of these documents must therefore apply under the EU settlement scheme. Um, this table is also provided in our comprehensive training manual, so you can refer to it later on if you need to. So now we're briefly going to discuss who must apply under the EU settlement scheme. So, as I'm sure you know, EU, EA and Swiss citizens and their family members need to apply under the scheme. This includes people who have been issued with documents under the EA regulations, even if, for example, they've been issued with a permanent residence document. Exceptions to who need to apply under the scheme include Irish citizens, British citizens, including those who have dual citizenship, and individuals who have already been granted indefinite leave to remain or indefinite leave to enter under the UK immigration rules. So on that last point, on individuals who have been granted indefinite leave to remain or indefinite leave to enter under the UK immigration rules, it's worth noting that while they do not have to apply under the scheme, they may want to do so. This is because if they apply for settled status, they will receive an up-to-date proof of their status. They will have better family reunion rights in which status under the EU settlement scheme is required. They will be permitted to leave the UK for five years without losing their indefinite leave to remain status. Whereas if you have indefinite leave to remain issued under the UK immigration rules, you will lose your status after two years of consecutive absence from the UK and they will avoid the potential consequences of being unable to easily evidence their right to reside in the future, as we all saw with the Windrush scandal. In terms of non-EA family members, there are two categories who qualify under the EU settlement scheme, direct family members and extended family members. In terms of direct family members, you have as shown on the table, spouse, civil partners, Direct descendants under 21, so for example, children or grandchildren under 21, dependent children over 21, and dependent persons in the ascending line, so for example, dependent parents or grandparents. In terms of extended family members, we have the group shown on this table, which includes durable partners, 
So that's unmarried partners, usually those who have lived together for two years, and other types of dependent relatives or members of the household in need of the EEA citizen's care. The primary difference between direct and extended family members that is important for you to know about for the purposes of the EU settlement scheme is that extended family members have to hold a document issued under the EU regulations in order to apply under the scheme. There are other categories of non-EA citizen family members who may also be able to apply under the EU settlement scheme, including those with certain types of complex cases. Um, these will be covered by me later in the, on in the training. And I'm now going to pass you on to Carla, who's going to discuss deadlines. Thank you, Bella. I'm just going to become uh, make myself present a second. Okay, great. Thank you. So the deadlines under the EU settlement scheme. The main deadline is the 30th of June 2021, which is the end of the grace period. This is except for a few cases. And this deadline applies to applicants who are resident in the UK by the 31st of December 2020, which is the end of the grace, uh, sorry, the end of the transition period. That means that the, at the moment there is some time pressure for certain groups of applicants who have to apply first under the EEA regulation 2016. So, um, as Bella described earlier, extended family members, like durable partners, they must hold first a residence card issued under the EA regulations before they can apply under the EU settlement scheme. Therefore, for this group of applicants, there's now time pressure to apply before the end of this year because the EA regulations will be repealed by the end of this year. Now we're going to go through the key requirements to apply for settler status. The key requirements are as follows. First one, it would be five years continuous residence in the UK. Secondly, the no supervening, no supervening event has occurred in the case. And thirdly, the applicant must meet all the eligibility and also the suitability requirements. Now, continuous residence means that the applicant cannot be outside the UK for more than six months in any 12 month period of the five years qualifying period. This becomes very important for those who have pre-settler status. But if in the future they want to upgrade to settler status, they need to take into consideration the maximum permitted absences for each 12-month period. Although this is the general rule, there are some exceptions. For example, when there is a single period of absence of more than six months, but which does not exceed 12 months. And because the, the, the absence has happened for an important reason, such as study, childbirth, or vocational training. The no supervening event has occurred is another requirement to apply under the EU settlement scheme. The Home Office defines supervening event in Appendix EU as follows. First, a period of absence from the UK of more than five years or, or four years if a Swiss citizen, since they last acquired the right of permanent residence in the UK, whether they have applied for the document or, or settled status. Is also a supervening event when the applicant has been issued with an exclusion or deportation or order under the regulations or other than under the regulations, meaning um, under the immigration um, uh, domestic legislation and not under EU law. Suitability requirements. We said earlier that another key requirement under the EU settlement scheme is for applicants to meet all the eligibility but also the suitability requirements. Now, those are considered in Appendix EU 15, which are the mandatory grounds of refusal, and EU 16, which are the discretionary grounds of refusal. We are going to discuss about this more about the mandatory and uh, ground of refusal a bit later on in the training. Overview of the application process. Well, we're going to give you now a very quick overview because we, we understand that most of you might be familiarized already with the application process. But just as a refresher, so there are three main checks in all USS applications. First check is to check the applicant's identity and nationality checking. This, for those who have a biometric passport or ID or have also a biometric um, residence card, can be done on the phone. Otherwise, it can be done the application online, and then the applicant can send the passport um, or the uh, yeah the passport or ID to the home office or otherwise those who do not have identity or nationality documents, they can request a paper application form. 
Now, the second check is the resident checking, which is done automatically through the Home Office checking um, applicants' HMRC and DWP records. And thirdly, the criminality checking. The identity and nationality checking, as I just mentioned, for those who have um, valid passport or national identity card, uh, that should be enough. Europeans need those, need those documents, so passport or national identity card, but non-EA EA family members, they can also provide their biometric residence card issued under the um, EA regulations 2016. As explained, for those who have a biometric uh, relevant document, they can apply using the EU Exit ID Document Check mobile app, which is available for iPhone and some iPhone and Android phones. For those who, do, who have a document that is biometric but do not have the technology required to scan the passport, for example, they don't have one of these phones who accept this mobile app, they can also go to one of the locations offered by the Home Office to do document scanning. If for those who do not have passport or ID, which is biometric, they can complete the application online and they can also post the passport or ID to the Home Office. And there is an extra requirement for non-EA family members, which is also as part of the application process, to book a appointment with Soprasteria to enroll their biometrics. Resident checking. As um, I said earlier, is automatically confirmed by the Home Office by checking applicants HMRC and DWP records. However, if those records do not show a continuous residence of five years and the applicant uh, confirms to you that they have been living in the UK for five years or more, there's also a possibility that they can also upload documentary evidence to show the residence in the UK. It's worth noting that there is some preferred, alternative, and unacceptable evidence, and you can find that a list of what is um, in each category in Annex A of the Home Office guidance. Criminality checking. Well, applicants who are age 18 or over are all required to disclose the criminal records, and the problem is that failure to do so might potentially trigger refusal on grounds of deception. In any event, all applications are also subject to checks against the police national computer, the warning index, and also overseas criminal records checks. That means eventually that some people with criminal records might be turned down for settled or pre-settled status as a result of that criminality checking and on grounds of suitability. Paper application form is, a diff is another route in which applicants can also apply under the EU settlement scheme. Paper application form normally applies for European citizens or family members who do not have a valid ID or passport, and also for some non-European family members who are applying under specific categories, and those are surrender saying, derivative right of residence, and also family members of dual citizens, also called, uh, called as loans case. Um, they will, in those cases, those who fall under one of these categories and need to apply under paper application form, they can call the EU Resolution Centre and basically ask for a personalised application paper form, and then they will have to complete it, put all the documents together, and post it to the Home Office. Processing times. The latest guidance, which is published, I believe, in May 2020, says that it takes around five working days for a straightforward application to be processed, but it can actually take up to a month. Processing can take longer than one month, according to the guidance, if, for example, further information is requested, the applicant is a minor and the application is not linked to an adult, the applicant has applied through a paper application form, the applicant has criminal records, or we're talking about a non-EA family member who is applying based on a relationship that they have never relied before on a previous application with the Home Office. Even though the guidance stipulates these specific processing times, in practice we are seeing like major delays under the EU settlement scheme. Now, if the delay is longer than six months, it might be possible to challenge it via a judicial mechanism called judicial review. And prior to that, um, solicitors will normally prepare a pre-action protocol letter, setting out why this delay could be unreasonable, unlawful in the case, and what's the detriment that is causing to the applicant. 
that means that not all delays might be challengeable, but if you experience, if you have a client who has been experiencing a massive delay for at least more than six months and they are suffering a detriment as a result and they're struggling and there is no reason why the application should be delayed, it might be possible to challenge it. Um, it might be that you don't have the accreditation um, to do this type of work, but you could also refer to a more senior immigration advisor or um, to other charities who might be able to help. At Here for Good, we have some capacity sometimes for challenging delays, so feel free to also reach us um, in case you have a client in this situation. Well, getting a decision. So this is normally what happens at the end of all the applications, uh, at the end of the application process. Normally, the application is approved, and in those cases, the applicant will receive a letter by email confirming that the application has been approved, or if they have applied by post, they will receive a letter by post. Now, this letter or email that they receive is not proof of the immigration status. That means the applicants need to view and prove their rights in the UK of settled or pre-settled status online. And this is because the EU settlement scheme is a digital system and applicants are not given physical proof of their immigration status in the UK unless they are non-EA family members. So those non-EA family members without already BLPs issued under the regulations are the only category of applicants that are actually given uh, a residence card under the EU settlement scheme. So, because we're talking about a digital system and the importance of viewing and proving your rights online, it's also same important to keep updating details. So, all the details provided when the applicant applied, such as a phone number, the email address, the home address, and the passport number. If any of those details change, it's important to update the home office, and this can be done quite easily online. Now, in certain instances, applications may be refused. Now, there are a few remedies against those refusals. There is a right of appeal for those applicants who made an application on or after 11 p.m. on Brexit Day, on the 31st of January 2020, and for those who applied before, they do not have a right of appeal. However, they still can, have, they still can lodge an administrative review. This applies to those who appeal on or after or before Brexit Day, and in any event, before the deadline, all applicants can also submit fresh applications. Losing a status. So this is a common question that sometimes people ask us. Is it possible for someone who has been granted settler status to lose it in the future? What are the situations that can trigger such, such a thing? So basically, uh, in terms of losing a status, those who have been granted settler status might lose that settler status if they spent abroad consecutively more than five years after they've been granted settler status, again, four consecutive years for Swiss citizens, and also quite importantly, subsequent criminal offending, so future criminal offending, might also lead to a revocation of indefinite to remain or settler status in the future. For those granted pre-settler status, they can lose automatically the right of pre-settler status for absences of more than two consecutive years. However, be very careful because even though they can leave the UK for up to two years without losing pre-settler status, the absence might actually jeopardize the ability to actually then upgrade to settler status because for, for them to apply for settler status, as we um, said earlier, they must be in the UK at least six months in any 12 month period of the five years qualifying period. Pre-settled status can also be automatically lost if it's not converted, if it's not converted or upgraded into settled status before the expiry date of the pre-settled status decision. We are now going to um, start talking about complex cases, more in common issues and common cases. Fantastic. Thanks, Carla. So I'm now going to start to take you through the main part of this training, which is looking at complex cases under the EU settlement scheme. So from our experience at Here for Good, cases under this scheme tend to become more complex when people do not have valid ID documents, 
people do not have evidence of residence and the residence has not been established by the automatic checks with HMRC or DWP, people lack mental capacity and people face technological barriers to applying. Often we find that people who face such issues can include homeless people, older persons, children in care, victims of domestic abuse, victims of trafficking and some people with disabilities. Other applicants can also face difficulties due to their criminal history or some non-EA family members face complexities due to their specific type of case. So we are going to start by discussing the following four common issues that we often see in complex cases, including lack of valid ID, lack of residence evidence, lack of mental capacity and digital exclusion. We will explain how to address each of these common issues as we go through them. So firstly, looking at lack of valid ID. People sometimes do not hold a valid ID as required by the scheme. So the Home Office EU Settlement Scheme guidance accepts that there must may be some limited cases where an applicant is unable to obtain a valid ID due to circumstances beyond their control or other compelling practical or compassionate reasons. In such cases, an applicant must apply using a paper application form and alternative evidence of their identity. There are several steps that we suggest taking when a person has no valid ID. These are that you first ensure that all reasonable steps are taken to obtain a valid ID. Second, if it is not possible to obtain a valid ID, you should identify the reason why the applicant is unable to obtain one. Third, you should then assist the applicant to gather alternative evidence of their identity and nationality. Fourth, you should request a paper application form from the Settlement Resolution Centre and if possible, you should also prepare detailed legal representations about this issue. So, step one, ensure that all reasonable steps are taken to obtain a valid ID. Now, there are two reasons why this is important. Firstly, where possible, it is preferable for the applicant to have a valid ID as it will make it easier for them to demonstrate their rights in the long term. For context, if an EU citizen applies without a valid ID, their digital status granted under the scheme will be connected to a six-digit application number provided in their acceptance letter rather than a physical ID document. So every time they want to prove their status, they will need to use that six-digit number on the online system. In our experience of supporting vulnerable applicants, it is much more beneficial for them to have their digital immigration status linked to a physical ID document rather than a random application number. In addition, most applicants will benefit in practice from having a valid ID as it may facilitate their access to public services or will allow them to travel. Secondly, in cases where no valid ID can be obtained, it's really important to be able to demonstrate to the Home Office that reasonable steps have been taken to try and obtain one. This is so that you can justify the use of a paper application form and alternative evidence of identity. In terms of taking steps to obtain a valid ID, if the ID has been lost or stolen, you should ensure the applicant reports it to the police and or national authority. Where needed, you can assist them to do this. You should also make inquiries with the applicant's embassy or consulate to find out what information, consent and documents are required to apply for a valid ID, whether it is possible for the applicant to apply for a valid ID from within the UK and the length of time it will take. An important tip is that you should make sure that you keep evidence and a record of all the steps that are taken to obtain a valid ID as these may be needed in support of the application. So step two, if the applicant is unable to obtain a valid ID, identify the reason this is the case and obtain evidence in relation to it. It is worth noting that you may want to refer to the Home Office EU Settlement Scheme caseworker guidance at this stage. This is because the Home Office guidance gives various examples of reasons that an applicant may not be able to obtain a valid ID. These are also set out in our training manual. For instance, the guidance includes reasons such as the document exists but is unable to be produced, for example as a result of the applicant being in a domestically abusive relationship, 
or there are compelling or compassionate circumstances. For example, the applicant has a medical condition, which means they are unable to travel from their home to the consulate to obtain a new ID. Where possible, you should provide evidence that demonstrates the reason they are unable to obtain a valid ID. The Home Office Guidance and our training manual also include examples of the types of evidence you could provide in different scenarios. Step three is to gather alternative evidence of identity and nationality. The Home Office has a non-exhaustive list of alternative evidence of identity that can be provided. This is also set out in our training manual and includes examples such as an expired passport or a UK driving license. You should refer to this list and help the applicant gather alternative evidence of their identity. So step four is then to request a paper application form from the Settlement Resolution Centre. You do this by calling the Settlement Resolution Centre and you will need to provide the applicant's details when you do so. It's worth noting that at Here for Good, we often find that in cases involving vulnerable applicants, it's best to provide your professional address for the Settlement Resolution Centre to send the paper application form to. This helps ensure that you receive the application form and is particularly useful when a client does not have a fixed address, such as when you're working with the homeless. Then step five, if possible, you should prepare legal representations to accompany the application in relation to the applicant's lack of valid ID. These should note the steps that have been taken to obtain a valid ID, the reasons it was not possible to obtain this, and why alternative evidence of identity should be accepted in the applicant's case. Where applicable, you can also make reference to the Home Office guidance. If you feel unable to draft such representations, you could refer the case on to a more senior immigration advisor at this stage. So the second issue that is often seen in complex cases, which we are going to look at, is lack of residence evidence. As discussed earlier, the main way in which the Home Office checks whether an applicant has been resident in the UK is through their automatic checks with HMRC and DWP. In most complex cases, the Home Office is not able to confirm an applicant's residence from these checks. This can happen for a number of reasons. For example, the applicant may have not been working or receiving benefits in the UK. The automatic checks also only go back seven years and so if the applicant is relying on five years of continuous residence in the UK that predate this period, the automatic checks will not be able to register it. If the checks do not confirm the applicant's residence, you will need to upload evidence of their residence in the UK. Now, the Home Office has a non-exhaustive list of preferred residence evidence. This is in Annex A of their guidance. And this is also in our manual that will be sent to you after this training. It is very important to note that if an applicant has been living in the UK for five years or more, you should assist them to apply for settled status, not pre-settled status. This is the case even if you are not able to obtain evidence of their residence for the full five year period. This is because settled status is a more secure form of immigration status that may allow an applicant easier access to benefits and public services. This can be life-changing in some situations, particularly when working with vulnerable applicants. And so, as you can see on this slide, the steps we therefore suggest you take with regards to lack of residence are, first, take all possible steps to obtain evidence of residence for the full five year period. And if it is not possible to obtain evidence for the full five year period, submit an application for settled status with detailed legal representations regarding the lack of evidence of residence issue. So in relation to step one, that is obtaining as much evidence of residence as possible, you usually want to check if the applicant has a UK bank account if so, bank statements can be a very easy way to evidence someone's residence in the UK. You also want to check if the person has registered with the GP or received medical support in the UK. If yes, you can request a letter from their GP or their medical records, both of which can serve as evidence of residence. 
if the applicant is being assisted by a support organisation, such as a homeless charity or a refuge, you can get a letter of support from that organisation, confirming since when they have been in contact with the applicant and known them to be resident in the UK. If the person is homeless, you can also request their chain records. For those of you who do not know, Chain is a multi-agency database in which key homeless charities record information about people rough sleeping that they have come into contact with. Chain records are very helpful for evidencing residents of homeless people, and we will talk more about them in our homeless training if you want to come to it in the future. It's also covered in detail in our manual. Finally, where the applicant has worked or received benefits over seven years ago and you are relying on that period of residence, you can request their old records from HMRC and DWP directly. It is worth noting that this is definitely not an exhaustive list. It is just examples of residence evidence that we often find useful to obtain in complex cases. Also, in terms of a practical tip, it is useful to note that when requesting records on behalf of an applicant, such as medical records or a letter from their GP, you will need to provide a signed form of authority from the applicant. So in cases where you are unable to obtain evidence of residence for the full five year period, you should assist the applicant to apply for settled status and write detailed legal representations about this issue. These should set out the reasons the applicant is eligible for settled status, the reasons they should be granted settled status despite their lack of residence evidence, any particular compelling circumstances that mean they are unable to obtain evidence of residence for a certain period, and note any steps that have been taken to try and obtain evidence of residence and the supporting evidence that you are able to provide. It is worth noting here that Here for Good have had several successful cases where there was very little evidence of the applicant's residence in the UK, but their application for settled status was successful. For example, we had a case where the only evidence of residence was one letter from his ex-employer. We submitted this letter with very detailed legal representations and a letter of support from the charity that was supporting the applicant, and it was successful. Please do therefore make sure you refer cases on to a more senior immigration advisor if you feel unable to write these detailed legal representations, but know that the applicant is eligible for settled status, they just simply do not have continuous evidence of their residence for the full five year period. So I'm now going to pass you on to Carla, who is going to deal with the next issue, which is lack of mental capacity. So, um, lack of mental capacity is the third kind of common complex issue that we have encountered sometimes of uh, supporting applicants under the scheme. This is quite a complex um, area of law, and I'm just going to point out a few things here just to help you to give you a bit of clarity on the topic, but uh, we don't pretend in this topic and this training to go very in depth in, uh, on, on mental capacity. But, Having said that, um, the law that provides us the, the legal framework of mental capacity is uh, mental, the Mental Capacity Act 2005. Now, Section 2 and 3 give us the definition of someone who lacks mental capacity as a person lacks capacity in relation to a matter if, if at the material time he is unable to make a decision for himself in relation to that matter because of, and this is the important bit, of an impairment of or a disturbance in the functioning of the mind or brain, okay? So uh, that is important, this definition is important because um, sometimes people might confuse having serious mental health issues with lacking mental capacity. Um, so it's not the same. Someone might have mental health issues but might not lack capacity in understanding fully the consequences of applying under the scheme and they might also understand like in general legal um, legal advice and immigration legal advice. So it's important that we stick to the definition in, in that sense to understand if someone is lacking mental capacity. If you encounter someone that you think that they might lack mental capacity because of their a disturbance of the functioning of the mind, they are unable to make a decision for themselves in regards to applying or not under the EU settlement scheme, 
you will then need to check whether, first of all, if there is any legal representative in, if in the life of that person that have a lasting power of attorney. You will also need to check whether if there is any deputy appointed by the Court of Protection or if there is someone in applicant's life that can act as the litigation friend. Now, the EU settlement scheme, in terms of lack of mental capacity, the only thing that says is that in most cases, the applicant's legal representative should make an application on their behalf. The problem, though, is that um, sometimes legal representatives might not be able to get instructed from uh, applicants that lack mental capacity. Now, the person acting on behalf of the applicant will need to be satisfied that, one, they have authority to do so, and second, that they are acting on the best interests of the individual in accordance, again, with the Mental Capacity Act 2005. The practical issues that we encounter when it comes to lack of mental capacity and the EU settlement scheme is, to start with, a lack of clear home office guidance, policy or procedure about applicants who lack mental capacity. As said, solicitors might be unable to complete applications if they don't have already a lasting powers of attorney, as they cannot be instructed by someone who lacks mental capacity. Social workers, we have encountered that sometimes might face problems in acting on their behalf um, due to a potential conflict of interest. Independent mental capacity advocates might not have funding in place to cover EU USS work. And in most cases, the reality is that applicants may need a deputy appointed by the Court of Protection. But this is a lengthy process. Um, and as we know, there is a pressuring now deadline uh, as to the 30th of June 2021 to apply under the scheme. So it's quite problematic at the moment still, the issue of helping applicants that lack mental capacity. Digital exclusion is another common issue, the, a common complex issue that we have encountered for applicants under the scheme. And this is because um, the USS is a, the whole system is a digital application process. And that uh, implies that some applicants might actually not feel confident using a computer, mobile, mobile device, might not even have the technology required to apply under the scheme, might not have access to the internet. So it's very problematic that the government in a way has set up a digital system without thinking about those applicants who might fall under what we call digital exclusion because they might not know how to use technology or might they not have access to it. The government's response to that has been this a assisted digital support via a agency called We Are Digital. So this is available um, to this support is offered over the phone, face-to-face -face support in a local center and in home tutors but applicants are not able to get immigration advice through this service. So <clears throat> we believe that if someone is at risk of digital exclusion, someone is not able to use the technology required to apply under the scheme, it's much better to uh, refer them, if you cannot help them directly to, with the application, to one of the organizations, to one of the charities that have been um, funded by the Home Office, to help applicants under the scheme or the charities that also might have funding to do so, as well as immigration advisors, because of course it's important for applicants to understand the immigration, um, the, the, the immigration advice attached to having indefinite leave to remain or a limited leave to remain and the consequences of applying, especially if they have um, serious criminality. Now, as set vulnerable applicants, and we see this all the time with homeless people, elderly people, some children in care, we see this all the time. Um, vulnerable applicants might struggle with accessing online applications, having the resources to scan the documents if, if they need to upload more uh, documentary evidence. They might not know how to complete the applications online, and added to that, they might have serious language barriers who might um, prevent them from understanding the, the wording of the online application. They will struggle also in setting up and maintaining email addresses. Many people do not use email address and they don't know how to use it. And sometimes they, um, they keep forgetting the passwords if they have mental health issues. And also understanding how to use this, the whole online service to access later on after they've been granted settler status or pre-settle, how to access that digital status is also another problem. So, as a practical step, a step, if you're helping a vulnerable applicant, we suggest that you help them with the following list. So, 
First of all, uh, because the status will be linked to applicant's email address, it will be very important that you help them to set up an email account if they don't have one, and explain them very clearly how to access, possibly making a note of their password. Uh, we see with homeless individuals with mental health issues that they keep forgetting their password, so it's important like all of that maybe gets written down for them and just to help them in the future to know how to access the, that status that is going to be important for them to navigate the system. Um, you will also need to help them with the scanning their passports, so doing the practical steps through the application online form and using the mobile app, scanning and uploading their documents. Of course, giving them like clear advice that the USS is a digital system and go through them and help them step by step, explain them very clearly how to view and prove they write. So if you have to maybe write like a, a self-help guide, a little guide for them so that they know in the future how to access that online service, you should do so. And informing them that they at all times should keep their status updated, which might be challenging, especially for example, for homeless individuals that keep changing temporary accommodation. They might change addresses very often, but as long as they can, they should always keep updating the home office every time that they change their personal information provided with the original application. Okay, so we have finished with the common complex issues, and now we're going to talk more about other common complex, maybe we, we call it cases, and these are those ones. So we're going to speak now a little bit more about suitability and criminality and how that might impact applications under the scheme. And then very briefly, we're going to touch on derivative rights of residents, retention of rights, those who might be fall under a surrendering applicant, and also a recap of the deadline under the scheme. When it comes to suitability and criminality, this is a quite a complex topic, and we have actually a full training on only on suitability and criminality, but we're just going to give you a brief, a brief overview. So, in all applications under the scheme, there's something called the suitability assessment. That means that the home office, that the home office with all applicants who are age 10 or over, they're all going to be subject to a suitability assessment as part of the application process. Now, this assessment conducted by the Home Office is um, conducted, of, co of course, on a conduct in a, on a case by case basis, and it's based on the personal circumstances in the UK, but also abroad, and it's also looking into whether the person have any criminal convictions in the UK or abroad, and and very importantly, if they have been open and honest in their application, okay? And this is why it becomes relevant for applicants to have a full, full account of their criminal convictions, because if they fail to disclose them, they might fall under the, a refusal because they have not been open and honest in their application, as the guidance states. So, criminality features quite heavily in the suitability requirements for the USS application. We already said that there is a self-disclosure obligation of criminal records only for applicants who are age 18 or, or over, okay? And failure to disclose relevant criminal convictions might potentially, potentially lead to a refusal on grounds of deception. We have not seen one so far, but it could be, it's possible that this could happen in the future. Now, um, the Home Office, as we said earlier when we were talking about the three main um, checks that, that are done under the scheme, Regardless of the fact that applicants have this self-disclosure obligation, the Home Office will anyway check applicants' police national computer warning index and will also check whether the applicants have overseas criminal record checks, okay? So they will anyway know the Home Office if someone has any criminal convictions, especially in the UK. The guidance establishes also that there are certain scenarios where the um, applicant doesn't need to declare that criminality, and this is basically when they have spent convictions, um, when they have warnings or cautious, and when they have alternatives to prosecution. So it's good to have, uh, it's, it's, it's worth to very basically like take uh, good instructions from, from clients to see whether maybe the convictions have already been spent, so they actually don't need to declare them. Now, apart from the self-disclosure requirement and the obligation to do so, um, in terms of suitability in itself, Appendix EU established in, a, in EU 15 the mandatory grounds of refusal. Simply, an application will be or must be refused if the applicant is subject at the time of applying, is subject to a deportation or exclusion order or a decision to make a deportation or exclusion order. 
So again, if someone thinks that there is deportation proceedings against them, you must check that with them. Uh, you must maybe need to request the criminal, um, sorry, the Home Office file if they're not too sure, because if there are current deportation proceedings against them, that would be a mandatory grounds of refusal. Discretionary grounds of refusal are also in Appendix EU in EU 16. Again, these are discretionary, so the Home Office will make a proportionality assessment to see whether it might be proportionate to refuse an application on the following grounds that you have in this slide. Namely, that the applicant, for example, submitted false or, um, or fraudulent representations. Um, the applicant is subject to a removal decision under the regulations, or if the applicant has already been refused admission under the EUSS, or the status has been cancelled, for example, for because of future um, criminality, or if the applicant is a relevant excluded person. So be aware that in those scenarios, um, someone applica someone's application can be refused. The first one, false or fraudulent representations are submitted. That could be, for example, when an applicant is claiming to be European when it's not, um, for example, is uh, providing a false document, or is or it's simply not declaring criminal convictions when they should do, do so, for example, okay? Now, um, in certain scenarios, as a result of the PNC checks and as a result of the information that the applicant provides to the Home Office, the Home Office might decide to refer the case to another immigration team called the Immigration Enforcement Team, and they will be then looking at, in, on a case-by-case -case basis whether it would be on the interests of the public policy interest to start the protection proceedings against an applicant that have applied under the scheme. Which applicants must be referred? So the USS suitability guidance give us a list of scenarios where if one of them has happened when someone has applied at the date of application, those cases will be referred automatically to immigration enforcement. Just to say some of them, it could be when an applicant has had a sentence of imprisonment in the last five years, or a custodial sentence of 12 months or more for a single offense, or if they have been resident in the UK for less than three years, and in the last three years, five years, sorry, and in the last three years, they have received three or more convictions, to give some examples. On those cases, if an applicant tells you that they, they, they fall in one of them, you should tell them very clearly that their case will be referred to immigration enforcement, and immigration enforcement will check whether it would be worth to issue deportation proceedings or not against this applicant. Okay, it's important that you give that information to the applicant for them to know exactly what is going to happen when they apply. And um, it's also worth noting that, um, um, yeah, so that immigration enforcement, um, that doesn't mean that automatically they will be deported or a deportation order will be made against them, of course not. Okay, they will do this proportionality assessment. And one other thing that I wanted to add on that point is that you will not be, you will not know when your clients application has been referred to immigration enforcement, the Home Office is not informing solicitors or charities that are supporting on that point. So you will possibly know that when the delay is being very long, it could be that it's because it's with immigration enforcement, but you will not know that. Now, there are certain situations where a case is not to be referred to immigration enforcement, and this is simply where there already has been a recorded decision to not pursue deportation against your client, or, for example, when a previous decision to the court has already been overturned on an appeal stage and no further offences have been committed after that, or when the applicant received a custodial sentence in the past and at the time the applicant was not in prison and the applicant's conviction did not meet the criteria for referral. And since then, no further offences have been committed. So not all cases will be referred. You need to be very carefully and looking with the applicants whether they have already being, for example, um, overturned, any deportation and appeal, etc. Conduct overseas, conduct, criminal conduct abroad also gains relevance when it comes to the EU settlement scheme. If the applicant declares previous overseas criminality or the PNC checks indicate that someone has been extradited from the UK or is subject now to a European arrest warrant or has an overseas criminal conviction, the Home Office guidance does not say that this application will be refused, but it does say that further inquiries will be made. So your client might be then invited to attend a, 
an interview with the Home Office or uh, they will be able, to, they will be invited to speak with the Home Office and provide more information if they think it's necessary. Now, on what basis can an applicant be deported from the UK? It's not the intention of this training to give you much information on deportation law. It's very complex and we don't really have time um, with this um, training right now, but just so you understand a little bit, um, someone under European law and also under the scheme, someone can be deported um, from the UK um, depending on when they committed the criminal action and they, they were, there's going to be different deportation tests and thresholds that will operate in those cases. Put it simply, for all that criminality that happened at, prior to the end of this year, and so all criminal convictions that happen until 31st of December 2020, that criminality will be subject to existing EU law thresholds on deportation, which are higher and more protectionist than those under UK deportation rules. Now, for criminal conduct that happened post the end of the transition period, so from January next year, the current, now, the current um, UK deportation rules, which are much more restrictive, will apply. So there is a difference between when criminality will happen and the test that will apply to that deportation will be different. Pending prosecutions is also an important topic that we see quite a lot. Um, applications sometimes might be paused until the outcome of the prosecution is known. And it will not be appropriate to post all applications, but the Home Office is posing most applications where there is a pending prosecution or an ongoing police investigation. Where it's paused, and once the outcome of this pending prosecution is known, the application then will be reconsidered under the scheme. Let me see if we, no, we have not included about a, a pending ongoing police investigation. So sometimes you can see when you help an applicant to apply that they receive an email automatically from the Home Office stating that there is an ongoing police investigation against them, therefore they're going to post the application and they will recheck the PMC um, in six months' time. It's worth taking instructions from your client uh, to understand what, the, what is this ongoing police investigation. The, the client might not have much information. And it's also worth to call the Metropolitan Police, for example, if you are told that this is a police force that is looking into this police investigation, Call them and find out more about this because it could be that the, 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 at the time when the Home Office ran the PMC check, at that point there's an ongoing police investigation, but it could perfectly be that in one month's time there's no ongoing police investigation anymore. The police have stopped investigating that person and no further action has been taken. They have then updated the PNC records to reflect that nothing pending is against the applicant, but the Home Office will not know until six months' time because they only they will post it automatically, the application, and not run a new check until six months have passed. So you don't want to leave your client with six months waiting when you actually could call if you are satisfied that there is no more no police investigation ongoing because the police have told you over the phone when you have called them, it's worth them to call the Home Office and inform them that if they could please run a check before the six months because it has now been updated and there's nothing pending against the client anymore. Okay, so it's just a tip to um, fight a bit these delays that we're seeing under the scheme and how you can help applicants sometimes to do it. Of course, this what I just said only applies for those cases where there was an ongoing police investigation, but it has been dropped. Basically, if it still continues, then there's nothing much you can do. Basically, now when it comes to prison and continuous residence, prison uh, time in prison is is important to consider because a continuous uh, qualifying period of five years might be broken where the person served or is serving a sentence of imprisonment of any length in the UK and the Ireland. Now this will depend on. If the prisoner prior to uh, his criminal sentence had already acquired permanent residence under the EA regulation, they should then in principle be granted settler status under the scheme as long as no supervening event has occurred since then, namely, for example, that they have not been issued with a deportation order. Now, if a prisoner prior to going to prison, they had not acquired uh, permanent residence by exercising treaty rights for more than five years, they then, upon release from prison, they then might be granted pre-settled status under the scheme. And time before prison will not come towards that continuous residence because that time has been broken by the prison sentence. 
So um, in terms of like people in prison, there is no legal reason why people in prison cannot apply under the scheme. But as far as we know, there are practical difficulties right now to do so uh, because it's difficult to access prisoners, it's difficult to access uh, ID for prisoners, etc. So um, it might be some there's some practical difficulties that might prevent loads of prisoners right now from applying under the scheme. Approach to children. Well, um, as we said, the EU settlement scheme guidance appears to exempt children from declaring the criminal convictions. So those children who um, are so basically under 18, they don't have to declare criminal convictions. But if they are from the age of 10 to 18, that criminal convictions that they might have, they will be part of the suitability uh, assessment that the Home Office will be carrying out. But they don't have to disclose a criminal convictions at all. The issues that we encounter with suitability and the EU settlement scheme is that sometimes, and that happens super often, so, um, especially with homeless individuals that we support, is that they have a lack of knowledge of the criminal records. They might not remember. And as we said earlier, failure to disclose relevant criminality might lead to a potential refusal on grounds of deception. So on those cases, if an applicant comes to you and they are not entirely sure of the extent of their criminal records, the easiest and, and, and quickest way to do is basically um, do a subject access request um, in order to get the criminal records from the criminal records office, ACROS. Okay, so you will need, you can do this online, you can go to ACROS website and you will see subject access request there and you can do it if you have authority for the client, you can do it yourself. You'll need a few documents to do so. You'll need to provide proof of identity of the applicant. You will need to provide the address history for the last 10 years of the applicant, including the dates, uh, from what date to what date they lived in that property. And of course, you will need to also upload a um, letter of authority if you're helping the applicant to do this subject access request. A quick tip in, in terms of address history for the last 10 years, there might be many applicants that do not remember the whole list of uh, addresses in the last 10 years or that they maybe possibly they haven't lived in the UK for the last 10 years. Just for you to be able to go to the next step in that subject access request, many, very often what we do is we just add some addresses that the applicant remember and then for the last years that the applicant does not remember, we just put like one of the addresses that they provided before. Um, so basically, a lot of times with homeless individuals that they only remember their current address, we sometimes put that current address for the last 10 years. We say in the application that that person has been in the last 10 years in the same address. That is for the practical purpose of like moving to the next step of the application. And at the end of the application process, there's going to be a box where you can add there more information. On that box, you then can explain that the address history is not accurate, um, that um, your applicant, for example, has only been in the UK for five years, or um, they have lived in many accommodations and they don't remember the addresses. And for the purposes of the application, you just stated that the current address has been the same one in the last 10 years, but it's not accurate. So as long as you explain that this is not true, um, it's fine, and we have done that many times um, applying um, for subject access request. Of course, if, you, if the applicant remembers address history for the last 10 years, you should disclose that. But if they don't remember, you need to move on to the next step. So that is the practical tip that we have been doing so far. Okay, so um, we having um, overviewed a bit about suitability, we're now going to speak about derivative rights of residence. I think Bella is going to now provide you a brief overview because, again, it's a very complex topic and we don't really have to go in depth. But Bella, if you can now... Um, yeah. Great. Presenter, thank you. Great, perfect. So yes, as Carla mentioned, we are now going to briefly look at derivative rights of residence for non-EA family members. It is worth stressing that the purpose of this part of the training is to raise your awareness of these types of complex cases, it is not to provide in-depth advice on how to deal with them. As these applications deal with more complex areas of law, it is likely you will need to refer such cases onto a more senior immigration advisor, depending on your level of accreditation. However, it is very important you're aware of these types of cases, so that if a non-EA citizen comes to you with one of the following situations, you know that they may have the right to apply under the EU settlement scheme and that you should refer them on for further legal assistance. And here for good may have capacity to take on such cases if you need somewhere to refer them to. 
So, derivative rights cases are derived from other areas of EU law that have been confirmed by European case law. Appendix EU refers back to the EEA regulations when addressing these cases. Some non-EEA citizens may have a derivative right to reside, which means they are able to apply under the EU settlement scheme. It is worth noting that a paper application form is required for derivative rights cases. The types of derivative rights cases include Chen cases, Ibrahim and Texera cases, Zambrano cases and dependent children aged under 18 of a primary carer in one of these categories. So, starting with Chen cases, which refer back to EA Regulation 16.2. An applicant may be able to apply under the EU settlement scheme on this basis if they are the primary carer of a child who is an EA citizen under the age of 18, is resident in the UK, is self-sufficient and would be unable to remain in the UK if the primary carer left for an indefinite period. So, now looking at Ibrahim and Texera cases. These refer back to EEA regulations 16.3 and 16.4. These include applicants who are the child of a former EEA citizen worker where the child is in education in the UK or their primary carer where requiring the primary carer to leave the UK for an indefinite period would prevent the child from continuing their education in the UK. So then we have Zambrano cases which refer back to EA Regulation 16.5. These include the primary carer of a British citizen if both of the following apply. The British citizen is also residing in the UK and the British citizen would be unable to reside in the UK or in another EA member state if the primary carer left the UK for an indefinite period. Now, it is worth noting that on the 2nd of May 2019, the Home Office made a fundamental change in its policy with regards to Zambrano cases. It noted that potential Zambrano applicants must first make a human rights application under British immigration law. We feel this effectively renders the Zambrano EU settlement scheme route useless unless you come across an applicant who has already been issued a residence card under the EEA regulations confirming their Zambrano right to reside. Finally, as noted before, dependent children under the age of 18 under the derivative rights categories that I've just discussed can also apply under the scheme on the basis of derivative rights. We also think it is worth noting at this point that non-EA applicants can combine different periods of EA residence, for example as the spouse of an EA national, with residence on the basis of derivative rights to accrue five years continuous residence in the UK and be eligible for settled status. Okay, so I'm now going to pass you on to Carla, who I think is going to deal with retention of rights cases. Yes. Thank you, Bella. Um, you're going to make me present here. So, yeah. retention of rights, again, um, as Bella just said, a very brief overview. This is quite complex, but you, we think you should be aware, uh, nevertheless, that um, there might be some, some applicants that might be able to retain right of residence after the relationship with the EU national has broken down, has ceased to exist, basically. So, the categories that we encounter, basically, are those ones. So you, for example, there might be some children in education whose European parent or a step parent died or left the UK. So they might be able to retain rights as well as the parent with the custody of that child. Also, it could be that, for example, a, there's an EU citizen that have died. And so the family member of that EU citizen might be able to retain rights if they have lived continuously in the UK with that EU citizen um, they have now deceased for at least one year immediately before they death. And also, um, we can see, uh, and this is happening more often, happen more often for those family members whose marriage or civil partnership ends with the EU national and who meet one of these criteria, so that the marriage lasted at least for three years, the couple lived in the UK at least one year together, 
prior to the initiation of divorce proceedings, or also the family member who has custody of the sponsor's child, or also there are particularly difficult circumstances, such as, for example, the family member being a victim of domestic violence, that might um, make that person to be able to retain right of residence as well. So quite complex, but these are more or less the cases that you can encounter. Now, um, if you encounter, this is a practical tip, if you encounter a case where a non-EEA family member has been granted, was granted preceptor status under the scheme on the basis of their marriage to the EU citizen, but after they've been granted set pre-settled status, for example, they divorced, um, the non-EA citizen can still continue to rely on the same grant of pre-settled status, but um, they still need to be satisfied that they meet the requirement of retention of rights because following the divorce, because when they want to upgrade in the future to settle a status, at that point, they will need to satisfy the Home Office that that pre-settled status continues because they retain rights uh, following the divorce. Okay, so it's important when someone breaks up uh, with the EU national to check whether that retention of rights are met or not. There was a new statement of changes to the immigration rules published on the 14th of May this year, and basically it's good news because the government expanded the definition of those who might apply under the EU settlement scheme on the basis of retention of rights because of domestic violence to not only um, spouse and civil partners, but also any other family member within the scope of the EU settlement scheme. So now this also includes children, dependent parents, or dependent relatives. Again, because sometimes we are all working with vulnerable individuals, it's important to be aware of the domestic violence element on the scheme. So if you are dealing with a non-EA citizen who has been domestically abused, uh, by an EU uh, national sponsor, etc., or other family member who have been in this situation, it's important that you are aware that they might retain the right of residence um, if after they, they broke up that relationship. Now, surrendering applications is another kind of category of possibly complex cases. And this basically is that some non-EU national uh, members can apply for an USS family permit to come to the UK under this route. And these are the cases where this non-EA family member is a family member of a British citizen who was living with uh, that British citizen in another member state of in the European Union. And now this British citizen who was exercising treaty rights in another member state wished to come back to the UK together with a non-EA family member. So that is what it, we call, uh, is co commonly known as a surrendering applicant. Now, for a surrendering application to be successful, the British family member must be one of the following. So, and that is the category of a sponsor. So it must be a spouse, husband or wife, civil partner or durable partner, parent or grandparent, um, child or grandchild, and other family members who also were adopted under an adoption order that is obviously recognized under UK law, and other extended family members. So, when it comes to surrendering, the EU settlement scheme takes us back to the European regulations and specifically to Regulation 9. So they must have genuinely made their home in another member step, uh, state. So they both must prove that um, that other European member state where they live, that was their main residence, the center of their life, they lived there together and they were integrated there. And the British family member will also have to show that they have a right of permanent residence in that EU country or that they were at least exercising treaty rights. For surrendering, there are specific deadlines under the scheme. So the guidance says that they must return and apply under the scheme by the 29th of March 2022. This deadline is only for surrendering applicants. If they are the spouse, civil partner, or unmarried partner, and their relationship started before exit date, so uh, 31st of January 2020, so before um, that day, or they are under 21 years old and are their child or grandchild, or they are 21 years old or older and they are the dependent child or grandchild, or also, and also they depend on parent or grandparent. So if an applicant falls under one of these categories, they must return and they can apply by the 29th of March 2022. But um, 
There's also a category of surrendering applicants that they must return by the end of this year and apply by the normal deadline uh, of the 30th of June 2021. And this is when the relationship, so they are the spouse, civil partner, and married partner, and the relationship started after exit date, so after the 1st of February 2020, and any other uh, dependent relatives as well. Okay, so there are different deadlines depending on when, who is the family member and when the relationship started for those who are in a spouse, civil partner, or married partner relationship. Okay, so we're gonna have now a little break. Uh, maybe uh, grab a cup of, a cup of tea or, or a coffee, and, and then after 10 minutes break, we're going to be looking into some case studies. So um, hopefully we will be applying to some of these complex issues and complex cases to, the, to a practical case study. And then the second part of this training will be much more interactive. Uh, you will be uh, answering with us the case studies, and then we are going to have some uh, Q&A at the end of the session. Okay, great. So we're now going to go through some case studies. So this is case study one, and we'll just give you a few minutes to read through the scenario. Okay, so I can see that someone has said in the chat that they cannot see the slides. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read through the facts for you. So we have Olivia and Alex, who are Norwegian citizens. They married in Oslo in 2012. They moved to the UK in February 2014, and they haven't left since then. Axel obtained a job, but forced Olivia to stay at home to carry out household duties. Olivia was a victim of domestic abuse. She was mentally and emotionally abused and physically mistreated by Axel. In January 2019, after years of abuse and violence, Olivia decided to change her life and left the family home together with her children. When Olivia was leaving the house, she took as many of her possessions as possible, including some of her children's school letters. However, while she could find the children's passports, she could not find her own passport anywhere. For her own safety, she will not be able to return to the house again. Since leaving their home, 
Olivia and the children have been supported and accommodated by a safe refuge. Social services are also aware of Olivia and the children's situation. For their safety, the children have moved to school. Olivia experiences low moods and depression and anxiety and is a vulnerable individual. She regularly sees a psychiatrist. Due to her particular circumstances, Olivia currently has little evidence of her residence in the UK. She has never been in employment or claimed benefits. Axel allowed Olivia to have her own bank account and card from May 2017 onwards, which she used to do the weekly food shopping with. However, other than that, Axel has kept all the utility bills and mortgage statements in his name only. The Refuge has contacted your organisation for assistance with attaining status for Olivia and her children under the EU Settlement Scheme. So, the first question is, what further information do we need to establish that Olivia is eligible under the EU Settlement Scheme? So, what do we not know about Olivia's situation from the scenario? So now if anyone wants to either message in the chat or speak out loud, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and give an answer to this question. Okay, so what we don't know from the scenario is whether Olivia has any suitability issues. You would therefore want to check this with her at your appointment. This is important because you need to check that she doesn't have any issues that would affect her eligibility under the EU Settlement Scheme. So, presuming that Olivia doesn't have any suitability issues, can someone answer, is Olivia eligible for pre-settled or settled status under the EU Settlement Scheme? So again, you can either enter your answer in the chat or you can speak out loud. Okay, I can see someone has written settled status in the chat. Great, thank you, Sarah. Oh, brilliant, and I can see a few more similar answers that are coming through the chat. So if we go to the next slide. Yes, Olivia is eligible for settled status, as a number of you have noted. This is because she lived in the UK for a continuous period of at least five years. She meets the eligibility and suitability requirements and no supervening event has occurred in her case. So the next question is, are Olivia's children, Nicolina and Anina, eligible for pre-settled status or settled status under the EU Settlement Scheme? Now, I'm not sure the scenario actually gave much information on Olivia's children, but let's say that Olivia and Axel had two children called Nicolina and Anina, who were living in the UK with them. Would these children be eligible for pre-settled status or settled status? Again, you can either write in the chat or unmute yourself and speak out loud. Okay, great. So I can see that someone has said in the chat settled status, and this is exactly correct. So as Olivia is eligible for settled status, her children will also be eligible for settled status. Now, we didn't cover this earlier, but this would be the case even if Nicolina and Anina had lived in the UK for less than five years. So, for example, if one of them was only three years old, they would have only lived in the UK for three years, but they would be eligible for settled status. And this is because children's applications can be linked to their parents' applications. And if they are linked, they will be given the same status as their parent. Now, this is covered more in our children's training session, if you'd like to come to that in the future. It's worth noting briefly that this only works if you're able to link the child's application to their parents. And so if the parent isn't in the picture, for example, the child is in local authority care and doesn't have any contact with their parent, then this wouldn't be possible and the child would need to rely on their own residence evidence. And therefore, if they had only been in the UK for three years, they would only be eligible for pre-settled status. 
but in this case, you're assisting Olivia and her children, so her children would be eligible for settled status if she's eligible for settled status. You just need to make sure that you link their applications to Olivia's application. If you want to learn more about this, I, I would really recommend that you come to our children's training session. So then in terms of the next question, we'd like you to identify the key common complex issues that are in this application. So what are the key issues that Olivia may face when she's completing her application? Mm. Great, so I can see Jason has said evidence of residence. That's correct. And we've also got lack of ID. Ludmilla has said this and also Sophie said ID, exactly. So those are the key issues that come up. So it's lack of valid ID and lack of evidence residence. And we also think it's worth noting Olivia's vulnerability. So we know that Olivia has been a victim of domestic violence and suffers from mental health issues. So how can we deal with each of these issues? So first looking at vulnerability. In terms of Olivia's vulnerability, it's noted in her case study that Olivia is a victim of domestic violence and suffers from low moods, depression and anxiety. It is therefore important to be aware of this throughout advising and assisting her with the application. Wherever possible, you should make reasonable adjustments to ensure that Olivia feels comfortable and safe. However, it's vital to note that there is no one solution to dealing with applicants with specific vulnerabilities. It is important therefore that you take an adaptable approach on a case by case basis and always follow your organization's safeguarding procedures where necessary. Now, in terms of valid ID, we know that Olivia was not able to find her passport as she was fleeing the family home. So it's important to explain to Olivia that usually a valid ID is needed to apply under the EU settlement scheme. In terms of the steps you should take in Olivia's case, these are, as you can see on the slide, so First, you should assist her to obtain a valid ID. You can help her find out the relevant procedures and requirements of the Norwegian Embassy and to gather the necessary documents and book an appointment. It's worth noting that support staff from the refuge may assist with this process. You will need to explain to the Norwegian Embassy what has happened to her ID, i.e. it's at her domestically abusive partner's house and, there is, and therefore is unretrievable. So then step two is for if it's not possible to obtain Olivia a new ID from the Norwegian Embassy. So if it's not possible, you should identify the reason Olivia is unable to obtain the ID and you should do so with reference to the Home Office's guidance. So in this case, she does have a valid ID, but she's unable to produce it as it is at her domestically abusive partner's home. Then, step three is to gather alternative evidence of Olivia's identity and nationality. You should have a look at the Home Office's non-exhaustive list in their guidance. Step four, you should request a paper application form from the Resolution Centre. And step five, if possible, you should write detailed legal representations with regards to the lack of residence evidence issue. It's worth noting that together with the detailed legal representations that explain the reason alternative evidence of identity should be accepted in Olivia's case, you should also include evidence of this, such as evidence of her contact with the Norwegian Embassy, that she has reported her passport as unobtainable, evidence of the difficulties faced in obtaining her a new passport, and evidence that she has been a victim of domestic violence such as a letter or report from social services confirming that Olivia is considered a victim of domestic abuse. So now looking at the lack of residence evidence issue. So we can go back to the case study slide and take a look. What does Olivia have as evidence of her residence? Again, you can either write in the chat or unmute yourself and speak out loud.
Exactly. So Jason has written bank statements. And yeah, so has Lyd Miller. That's correct. So we know that from May 2017, Olivia has had bank statements which she could use as evidence of her residence in the UK. Someone has also noted GP records, which is great. So let's go to this slide and we can see that it states these two items, bank statements, and to check whether she has been registered with a GP. And if so, you could request her medical records. The slide also notes that you could get letters from her children's school confirming that she is registered as a parent at the school. This will help show evidence of her residence in the UK as well. Great, okay, so then the final step, and this is only if you are unable to obtain evidence of residence for Olivia's five year continuous period. So in this case, you would submit an application for settled status with detailed legal representations setting out why she is eligible, why she should be granted settled status, and the compelling reasons that she does not have evidence of her residence for that full five year period. In cases like Olivia's, it would definitely be worth submitting a letter of support from the local refuge or any other evidence you have demonstrating that she is a victim of domestic abuse and that this is the reason that maybe you can't find five years continuous evidence of residence for her. Okay, so we're now going to move on to case study two, and I'm going to pass you on to Carla for this. Yes, so we will then provide you again a couple of minutes. This, uh, the facts of this case study two are shorter, so and I think you might just need like a couple of minutes to get familiar with the facts, and then we will discuss it together. So yeah, wait two or three minutes. In two minutes, I will also summarize the facts for those who are unable to uh, read well the slide. Bella, can you make me present, please? Yeah, of course. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to go now and summarize the, the facts of the case study too. In this case, we have Liam. He's a Swiss citizen. He is a graffiti artist and suffers from serious mental health conditions. We, um, he entered the UK in January 2013 and has li been living here ever since, so we don't have any information about any absences from the UK since he entered. He has a history of drug and alcohol dependency and mental health issues. He also suffers from ep epilepsy due to a traumatic skull fracture as a result of an accident he had supposedly in the UK in 2016. He has been arrested several times and also been convicted of some uh, minor offences as shoplifting or antisocial behaviour. He doesn't know because of his um, mental health issues, he doesn't remember ex the exactly full details of his criminal history in the UK. Although he has various criminal convictions, he only recalls being in prison once for three weeks. He doesn't, has never been issued with any deportation, exclusion order or removal direction. He has a Swiss biometric passport and good evidence of his residence in the UK. So um, the first question would be, 
given the facts, do you think he should apply for settle or pre-settle? I don't know if someone wants to say anything in the chat. Set, uh, yeah, so I can see that you're saying settle. Yes, exactly. So that one is, was um, quite easy. So we said that we know from the facts that he entered in January 2013 and he's been here since then. So it's a case of settle status. Now, if you remember when we were going through the QI requirements, one of them was that um, he meets all the suitability and eligibility requirements. So um, it might be that because of the discriminality that he has in his case, it might be possible that he might be refused on ground of suitability. It's a possibility, but we don't really have much information about his criminal records yet. So what are, bearing in mind the case, uh, the facts of the case, what, are the, what is the key issues? that he will face when completing the application, do you think? Does anyone want to say anything? Otherwise, I'm just going to go through it, which is basically um, a lack of no, uh, potential knowledge of criminal records. So because he doesn't remember exactly Sarah, um, Sarah just said suitability information on records. The starting point is he can't remember his the full history of criminality in the UK or overseas, um, and there is a self-disclosure requirement under the scheme. So first of all, we need to know first what is there. Secondly, he might potentially face a referral to immigration enforcement, and of course, because of his criminality, he will undergo uh, a suitability assessment. How can you deal with these issues? What would you do then? Does anyone want to say anything? <coughs> So Sarah and Miriam said, yes, let's do a subject access request. Exactly. This is what you will do in this case as a starting point to get to know his criminal records. Um, in regards to the potential referral to migration enforcement, there's nothing much you can do apart from actually informing him, informing him clearly that he might fall under, um, for example, this category of having three convictions in the last three years, also, on the, um, another trigger of immigration um, of referral could be a prison sentence in the last five years. So it seems to be some elements in the case study that point out that his case possibly is going to be referred to immigration enforcement. And also, as a third point, you really need to explain to Liam that as part of this suitability assessment and as part of this immigration enforcement referral, um, the Home Office will consider whether to issue deportation proceedings against him or not. And the deportation thresholds will be different depending of, on when he committed his criminal offence. Well, in this case, it seems that all the criminality has for now happened before the end of the transition period. So EU law uh, thresholds on deportation will be applying in Liam's case. And that means that um, the test applicable will be the uh, policy and public security test as defined in the European regulations. And the Home Office will be considering not only the criminality, but also a, uh, they will do a proportionality assessment looking at the particular facts of the case. They will look at how long he's been in the UK. It seems it's been for more than five years. Um, family links and any other um, possibly compelling circumstances, for example, the fact that he has serious mental health issues, etc. So all of that will need to be explained. In our experience, and as long as he has like minor convictions, that should not trigger a, um, that should not meet the European deportation threshold on deportation. But again, we don't really know his criminal records in full. We don't know how persistent has been his criminality. So I think in any case, we will need to explain to Liam all of that, basically. So for him to understand the consequences of applying under the scheme. We have another case study now. Um, we're going to go through it, and then we will um, take some questions if you have. Um, again, we give you like a couple of minutes if you want to read the, um, the facts of the case. Carla, before we start, I think Sarah has a question, but I I can't work out. It says including his spell in prison. Sarah, maybe if you unmute yourself, yeah. you can ask a question in person. Hello, Bella and Carla. Thank you. Yeah. So I was just I was just querying. We know that he has been in prison. Will that will that the, the offence can the offence still be regarded as minor? This is a very good question because um, you remember when we talk about time in prison might break the continuity of residence as well. 
I mean, here, um, we don't know the dates when he went to prison. It could be that he went to prison after he acquired permanent residence if he was at uh, treaty rights. And in this case, that time in prison might not have any impact on his qualifying, um, continuous qualifying period of five years. But time in prison is something to look very carefully. Um, as you point out here, um, he only recalls being in prison for three weeks. That points out very minor offense. And so again, that the suitability assessment will take into consideration the seriousness of defense. And that seems to be a very small offense, like minor offense. But again, um, it's important to understand all of that. Yeah, through the subject access request, time in prison might have an impact on, on his qualifying period, definitely. Um, Great. Also, we've been in touch sometimes with the Home Office, and even the time in prison breaks continuity of residence, we have been assured sometimes that if it's a very small time, like one week, two weeks in prison, that might not have an impact on the qualifying period. I think the approach is quite, quite case-to-case basis, but um, very careful with, yeah, with prison time in general, I think. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. I'm going to now move again to uh, facts. Three, case study three. So again, we give you like one or two minutes if you want to quickly read it, and then we will go through it. Okay, great. Shall we do it together, Carla? Yes. Great. Um, so I'll just summarize the facts for those of you who who haven't been able to read it on the screen. Um, so Marie is a French citizen. She is 47 years old. She lives in London with her two sisters. They all moved to the UK together with their mother in 2000, so a long time ago. Marie has severe learning disabilities. She is blind, has a speech impediment, and severe brain damage. She also has reduced mobility, uses a wheelchair, and needs 24-hour support with all aspects of her life. Marie's mother was her main carer, but she recently passed away. One of her sisters, Chantal, is now her main carer, and she has been appointed by the Court of Protection as her deputy. So her sister has been appointed by the Court of Protection as her deputy, um, and she has severe learning disability, disabilities. Recently, Universal Credit has re rejected Marie's application for benefits on the basis that she does not have a right to reside in this country, even though she's been here for 20 years holding a French passport. She has been in receipt of disability benefits for a number of years, and the DWP records should confirm this. She also has plenty of medical evidence and a biometric French passport. Chantal has a mobile phone, but it is not an Android or an iPhone. Chantal has come to your organization for assistance with her sister Marie's application under the EU settlement scheme. So let's ask Carla, do you want to control the slides? Go on. Yeah. So first question, as always, do you think she should apply for settle or pre-settle? 
possibly quite easy this case yes okay. of course she's been a long time i think 20 years mm -hmm. and again in the facts it doesn't, doesn't say anything that they move back uh, to france or to any other country during this time so settled should be the answer and in this case it seems that she made the eligibility and suitability we don't have much information about suitability but it doesn't seem the case and no supervening event has occurred what are the key issues do you think in this case then if she was your client what will you be looking you will be looking at does anyone say anything if not um digital exclusion great legal representatives and vulnerability exactly um this is this was actually um a real case that we had of course with different names and, and facts etc but very similar and these are the things that we have faced definitely lack of mental capacity digital exclusion and problems with mobility which is a practical barrier to apply in the scheme as well how can you deal with these issues then what do you, what would you do to help him let's see if someone come up with an idea if not yeah, pay application. Okay, let's see one second with the facts if she has a phone. I sorry, a phone, a passport. Does she have a passport? Yeah, she has a biometric yeah. French passport. She has a biometric French passport. So she doesn't really need to apply in the paper application form. And I will not recommend her to do so because um it will take longer the application to be resolved. Um we see that her sister Chantal has a mobile phone, but it's not an Android or an iPhone. So, I don't know if, Bella, you want to cover that point. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, go on. Sorry, um, not this one, it's this one. So, that, that would be the answer to what to do when it comes to digital exclusion. So, yeah, Chantal informed you that she cannot help her sister because um, she cannot download this mobile app that has been designed to do these applications. And also because of her mobility, she really cannot take her sister to one of the locations that are offering ID document scanning. So there's no much solution here apart from you or finding a charity that actually can send someone to do the application on her behalf. Um, so basically, that would be the step. Like this is what we had to do. In, we had to go in person to her house and actually help her to uh, do the scanning of the document. And before that, we had this other issue of mental capacity. I think someone said legal representative. Jason said legal representative. Of course, uh, that was another issue here. How we can represent her if she lacks mental capacity? Mental capacity. Well, um, that's fine. She would. She's unable to understand legal advice, as we said. But here we have a solution within the facts of the case, which is the fact that actually we are lucky because Chantal, her sister has informed you that she has already been appointed by the Court of Protection and she has a deputy and a, and a court order. So because of that information, actually uh, Chantal can help directly Mary to, uh, to apply in the scheme with your supervision and with your guidance. So she can be the one doing her application. Of course, she will need to then upload copies of the court order uh, being in which she's being appointed by the Court of Protection as a deputy and also um, a and you can get also a letter of authority from Chantal directly if you were to write legal representations in Marie's case if, if that was needed. So um, as a practical step, we're saying here you should then complete the application and sign the declaration in case that you are being instructed by Chantal to do it, not by Marie, who cannot instruct you, and make the uh, Marie's application on her behalf and upload a letter in the evidence section of the application form to inform case workers of these circumstances as well as upload um, a covering letter and a letter, a covering letter and a copy of Chantal's appointment by the Court of Protection. Um, that would be one option, or the other option would be for Chantal to do the whole application under kind of your guidance as well. So that are the two main issues in this scenario. So I'm thinking if we have any other things to... Oh, yeah. So we have encountered sometimes some technical problems with the scanning the face using the EU exit ID document check app. Sometimes they might not, um, with, with those applicants who have learning disabilities, sometimes it might be difficult because they cannot keep still and look straight into the phone's camera. This is very easy to uh, remedy because you 
all you need to do is just to skip that step. Lots of people don't know that, and then they call here for good and and a bit stressed because they don't know how to help the, the family member to do that bit of the application form. You, all you have to do is basically skip that step and then provide ev different evidence of um, to prove the applicant's application uh, to prove the applicant's identity basically if they cannot use that uh, the device uh, because they cannot look straight into the camera. So all of this is also explained in our training material um, if you need to know a bit more. Okay, so that's the end of our training for today. We are now going to move on to a Q&A for those of you who are watching live. For those of you who are viewing this recording at home, thank you very much for watching our webinar. We hope that you found it useful. Please feel free to refer to our detailed training manual if you want to look back at the written solutions to the case studies or refresh your memory on anything you have learned today. Thank you very much and goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye.